Okay, so friends and enemies, welcome to the Forensic Focus podcast. Today, we are very privileged to have with us Eva Galperin and Emma Pickering, who are joining us to talk about some of the aspects of DFIR in domestic abuse and how it impacts on that. So, ladies, if it's quite all right, would you be so kind as to introduce yourselves and to tell us who you're working for currently and what your areas of interest are where they cross over with ours, which is digital forensics and, and incident response. Uh, hi, my name is Eva Galper and I'm the Director of Cybersecurity at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, I also am a co-founder of the Coalition Against Stalkerware and I uh, spend an uh, alarming amount of time <laughs> doing uh, abuse cases uh, for uh, victims of tech-enabled abuse. Um, Prior to specializing sort of in tech-enabled abuse, I spent a lot of time uh, trying to protect uh, journalists and activists from uh, government spying. And uh, it turns out that uh, these are people with extremely similar problems. So there, there's a lot of stuff that, uh, that goes from that experience to this experience very easily. Hi, I'm Emma Pickering and I work at Refuge. We're the UK's largest single provider of domestic abuse services and my role is Head of Tech and Economic Abuse. Um, I oversee the Technology Facilitated and Economic Empowerment Team and we directly support su survivors of tech facilitated abuse. Uh, my team works on campaigns, legislation, we look at uh, making sure that survivors can enter into a refuge and safe accommodation safely because now we see a number of ways in which they can be tracked and monitored. We also work in partnership as well alongside the survivor with children as well, because we recognise that children also are very much victims of tech facilitated abuse. My areas of interest, I'm also part of the Stalkerware Coalition as a working member. Um, we're seeing, or unfortunately, an increase in complex tech abuse concerns in Stalkerware in the UK. Um, and I'm currently researching for my thesis as well, which is looking at tech facilitated abuse and domestic homicide reviews. So looking at seeing where the pattern is when somebody's unfortunately been murdered, where tech facilitated abuse hasn't been identified by agencies. Okay, so um, you, you, you're you're currently in Australia, I understand, and you you said that you were you were there for work purposes. Is that is that facilitating your current uh, research goals, or is that is that related to something else? Yes, so I'm here because I've um, secured a Churchill Fellowship. So with that, I'm looking at digital forensics and best practice across um, different states, different countries and continents. So I'm currently in Australia um, speaking to police, legal firms, um, tech researchers, and then I'll go to Estonia in um, October, the end of October, um, looking at how they kind of navigate survivors in their country, because obviously it's a completely digitalized society. And then I'll complete hybrid learning in November. Yeah, amazing. So how how are, are the two of you together to, to talk to us today? What's your relationship between each other? I mean, we we have worked in sort of the same circles for many years on uh, on various campaigns and also on sort of tackling the the broader problem of tech enabled abuse. Um, because uh, one of the sort of interesting things about stalkerware as a um, uh, as a topic is that people get really interested in stalkerware because stalkerware is very scary. It completely takes over your device, uh, and so every time that uh, a victim of tech-enabled abuse feels that they cannot trust their devices, they feel, oh, it must be stalkerware. Uh, and also uh, people who do, you know, sort of news programs and uh, who write, you know, science fiction and things like that find it, you know, this, these are very sexy topics. Um, but for the most part, when we look at tech-enabled abuse, uh, it's, for one thing, it's usually not stalkerware. Uh, and even when it is, stalkerware is only a single component of a much broader campaign of tech-enabled abuse. Uh, and so Emma and I have worked together for uh, for many years, on and off, on various things, uh, looking at the the different things that uh, that abusers do in order to control their victims. And that goes beyond stalkerware. It includes uh, uh, Bluetooth-enabled physical trackers. Uh, it includes 
includes uh, account compromise, it includes all kinds of uh, IoT devices, uh, and uh, also it includes uh, sort of bringing in friends and family members and sort of group stalking and uh, ex often exploiting children that uh, that are going back and forth if in the abusive relationship uh, the parents are separated but they still have to co-parent a child uh, and often their devices are are sort of used as a uh, as a way of uh, continuing the abuse so we're looking at a, a very kind of broad uh, range of tech enabled abuse and and how to fight that because just focusing on stalkerware is really uh, looking at the problem in a very myopic way and, and in that regard are we you know obviously like you say stalkerware gets a a, a massive um, public interest story to it but I mean obviously you know Apple iPhones and uh, I mean find my Apple is is a very uh, a, a very useful thing and, and lots of people are joining the accounts and you take the box to, to share all of that information so what is the sort of the the, the breakdown roughly percentage wise if you know that that is actually you know specific stalkerware malware type stuff versus uh just misapplication of legitimate tech um it's hard to know uh, like I could tell you the percentage of people who come to me. I could tell you, you know, sort of a, a percentage uh, based on you know kind of the uh, number of detections of stalkerware that uh, companies that are in our coalition have uh, have detected. Um, but it is different across different uh, you know um, geographic regions and also uh, across different socioeconomic uh, sort of classes and, and strata. Uh, and so I think it would be really difficult to to generalize. Uh, I think the only generalization that I would be comfortable making is that uh, in cases where it's just uh, where where you find stalkerware, it is almost never just stalkerware that is being used as a tool of abuse. So it's 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 a a, a more advanced level of of you know uh, manipulation of an individual perhaps you would say because obviously they're using Sometimes. the lower levels yeah okay Sometimes uh, one of the one of the things that I think a lot of people really miss about stalkerware is that commercial stalkerware is stupidly easy uh, it, it is meant uh, to be usable by a non-technical person. Uh, and so people are, are frequently very scared of stalkerware because it gives you essentially, you know, root access to the phone and uh, it is extremely powerful. And they associate that kind of power with people who are very technically skilled. Uh, what stalkerware does is it puts that power into the hands of non-technically skilled people. When you were explaining kind of the, the bigger gamut of techniques that people use to facilitate this tech abuse to stalk their victims. The kind of miter attack popped to mind in terms of there's obviously stages as people go through to stalk their victims. Is there any kind of consolidated list that the foundation has or anywhere else that kind of explains the different types of abuse that victims might experience and then whether it's evidence on their phone or evidence otherwise that kind of al would alert them if they weren't aware, if they knew of this thing that exists, that they're potentially being stalked by their partner or, or family member or, or someone else. Um, I don't mind answering from our perspective yeah. in the UK. Um, when, when we're supporting survivors, the first thing that we do is try and establish a safe way that we can make contact with them. Because what we've identified is a number of agencies will kind of go ahead and make contact with them. They're becoming more aware that they can't make uh, conversations with them over the phone because they're quite alerted to the fact that the phone could be monitored. But what we're finding is agencies are then contacting them via email, which is just as concerning because the perpetrator mm. is still going to be able to access the emails. Um, but what we'll do is make safe contact. We hand out a number of burner phones to survivors every week. And then after we've set up safe contact methods with them, we'll complete a tech assessment. We've designed these ourselves at Refuge and there to enable us to unpick everything that's happening. So try and find patterns of abuse, trying to find um, devices, accounts that the person has in their name or associated with the perpetrator, 
or the children's devices and accounts. And we have to go through things in exact detail as well. And then what we do is create a bespoke safety plan. And I think that's the key there is bespoke because sometimes people try to have a very kind of generalized approach to it. So in the same can't apply to everybody because every person's um, situation is very individual. So one person, for instance, may still want to kind of remain with the abusive partner for a period of time until it's safe to flee. So we need to work with them for a number of months to put safety measures in place so they can leave safely or they may have left already and they need to ensure that that person can't track and monitor them to the next location. So the advice that you would give the, each individual is very different because their situation is different. So it's really about having that bespoke information with a specialist agency that understands the nuances around tech facilitated abuse. So even though it's unique to each person and, and depending what they want to do, are the underlying patterns for the tech abuse though that you find with the abusers similar and is there a pattern there like they they escalate from like eavesdropping conversations first to then like account control like looking at emails and then stalkerware is kind of like an end thing that gets like escalated in the end or is it drops at the start yeah I'm seeing yeah. some yep. shaking heads, so there's no... Yeah, I was going to say, uh, unfortunately, no... the, um, the the camera doesn't track movement. It only tracks your voice. So... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but Eva, Eva is shaking her head quite emphatically for, for the yeah. people who yeah. haven't there's, that. Yeah, there's, there's no, like, escalator of abuse where, you know, it starts with one thing and then it moves on to a bunch of other stuff. You, you uh, and that, you know... W each step is more invasive than the last. Uh, that's simply not the case. You, you cannot predict what direction it's going to go in. You can't predict what kind of tracking they're going to do. Uh, the only thing that you can predict is that the abuser is, uh, is lazy. Uh, they will not uh, go through more trouble than they absolutely have to in order to, main control, uh, to maintain control of uh, of their their target, their their victim. Um, having said that, uh, there are abusers that will go through a you know tremendous amount of trouble in order to continue abusing, controlling, or uh, or harassing uh, their uh, their victim. And uh, if you are providing support to a survivor. Um, you don't immediately know how far the the abuser is willing to go, uh, which is a really big problem in trying to put together a, a safety plan for them. Uh, and that's one of those re uh, times when you really have to um, you have to trust the survivor. Uh, you you need to leave the decision up to them. You know, if do you want to take the stalkerware off the phone? Do you want to confront the abuser? Do you want to you know take away their ability to track your location, uh, and therefore tip them off that uh, that you mm. are onto them? Uh, do you want to leave your abuser? Uh, do you want to go back to your abuser? Do you want to lock them out of your account? Do you want to give them your password again? Uh, one of the most frustrating aspects of working with survivors of abuse is uh, that uh, leaving an abuser is not easy. Uh, on average, a, a survivor will try to leave their abuser uh, at least seven times uh, before it actually sticks. Um, and so if you are doing this kind of work and you are not willing to see the survivor go back to their abuser repeatedly, uh, this, is, this is not the job for you. Mm. Yeah, but I think that's interesting because looking at the, the domestic homicide reviews, and this is only very much a UK perspective, what, we're, what I'm identifying as well is they're having to go back because of the level of monitoring and tracking and coercion and blackmail. I was reading one report where a victim unfortunately took her own life because every time she tried to leave, he'd monitored everything so he knew her plan. So every time she went to leave the front door to make that escape plan, and she'd been involved with numerous agencies, the police, domestic abuse organisations, he could rumble her plan, turn back up again. He worked abroad, he would divert planes, he'd change his business plans, and he'd come back home. So she was never able to safely leave. And her only option at the end, she thought, was to kind of escape through taking her own life because the monitoring was so severe. 
So I think Eva's right. It's about reminding people that the level that a perpetrator will go to to monitor and survey and blackmail and coerce somebody. Hmm. You've you've suggested the the ideas of not doing something and taking the the stalk away or, or closing the accounts or, or anything like that out. Is there any concept of uh, misinformation or false information to enable an escape? Does that exist within your security plans and your strategies? Oh yeah, that's incredibly common. Okay. Uh, in, fact, uh, yeah. uh, in fact, one of the things that I, uh, that I sometimes do when uh, helping to create security plans uh, with survivors of abuse uh, is I, I introduce them to the, uh, to the concept of a barium meal. Uh, when you when you have information that's leaking and you don't know the source of the leak, what you do is you you know feed all of your potential leaks uh, slightly different information and you wait to see what uh, you know, what information the attacker acts on. Uh, and uh, I've definitely gone through this process with uh, with some survivors before. Uh, Spycraft turns out to be uh, surprisingly useful in uh, in this setting. That's uh, that, that, that's fascinating, and and you know, do you do you extend that to the to, to the sort of the, the ultimate degree of feeding in false data in the sense of you know we we're able to manipulate things like GPS tracking and stuff like that? Is that a, a length that you do are, are able to go to, or are you uh, is that I have. Your- I have rarely suggested feeding false GPS data, but I have suggested simply handing uh, handing a tracker off to someone else, waiting to see whether or not the uh, the abuser shows up in the other place, um, making uh, false calendar entries to see whether or not this causes the abuser to uh, to show up in a specific location. Uh, so yeah, there there are all kinds of ways to to feed false information okay. to uh, to abusers but again you absolutely have to center the um, uh, uh, you have to center the survivor and their uh, understanding of how much risk they're willing to take and how far they are willing to uh, to push their abuser I don't want to ever want to do anything that makes the survivor uncomfortable that they think that they should not be doing yes I mean obviously you deal with a risk profile that is considerably higher than than the average sort of uh, forensic analyst or, or or incident responder that we we deal with i mean I, i've done domestic abuse cases but only after a convi- or after an arrest so for my side of things it's it's purely a forensic aspect of looking to see what has happened previously as opposed to actually attempting to do anything actively um, the technical aspect is is in some ways very uh, very different um, because uh, when when we do technical work of you know, when you're trying to lock an attacker out of a system, uh, the assumption is that once you have locked them out, they're out. I mean, maybe they will try to get back in, but that there is no uh, there is nothing to be gained from letting them stay in there. Um, there. There's certainly nothing to be gained from from letting them stay in there. But I mean, I was going to say Alex works in incident response, and I was. I was talking with a colleague earlier today about an incident response whereby, um, you know, a, an, a company has rebuilt their IT systems five times um, and uh, they got locked out of their own building this morning because the attacker is still inside of their systems. And I must, you, you must be facing the same sort of information security problems of, of this persistent, uh, sort of, you know, the advanced persistent threat kind of stuff as we do. You know, an email... You, you do an account reset or a password reset, and it goes to an email address that is already compromised, and immediately you're into into huge things. So, so it must be a very broad field that you're operating in in that regard. An APT that is motivated by a sort of a psychotic need to control you or gain revenge on you is exceptionally scary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How 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 common is that that you would come across? Like you said, that it, it kind of differs across socioeconomic, um, and you're probably dealing with a, a wide range of intelligences in some people being very non-technical, trying to control. But there would be that end of the spectrum where you've got quite an intense, intelligent person stalking someone. Is that common, or is, like probably not common, but? Is there many cases you come across where you come across someone who's very intelligent, technically savvy, and and stalking someone and abusing tech that way? 
I've come across people who are extremely persistent uh, and who are sometimes technically savvy, but I would not describe them as particularly smart. Okay. <laughs> we've, I, we've got a, um, we've started to create a spreadsheet where we need to be mindful of particular individuals because obviously we associate with tech developers, different platforms, and mm -hmm. we have a number of perpetrators where they're associated with, you know, in high profile roles. Um, and I don't just think it's a level of, you know, intelligence. I think it's also their networks, their ability, their contacts, their money. Mm -hmm. I think it's a number of things that make them quite powerful and give them access um, to a victim in a way that other, you know, other ind perpetrators may not necessarily have. So I think it's a number of things. I don't just think it's their level of tech knowledge that puts them at such a threat. I think it's sometimes their connections mm. and their money. Sometimes they just pay somebody. And also what we're seeing in the UK is a lot of proxy stalking and harassment. So there's particular websites, blogs, pages that perpetrators have created where they will kind of tag team. So they'll, they'll have a rota of where they will um, harass and abuse their partners and their other partners. So then they can, you know, take, take a step back, concentrate on a piece of work and do something with their family and friends. So they've got Tuesday free because Saturday is kind of dedicated to harassing multiple people across different platforms. But that also helps feed into um, it's difficult then for police to try and track to see who the perpetrator is because there's multiple perpetrators. Mm. Multiple that is absolutely terrifying and the first yeah. time I've ever heard of that. Um, so obviously that's you know deeply shocking to to any sane and normal human being that people collaborate like that to do something like that. Um, I'm a bit of a loss for oh, words. Oh yeah, there are entire that. forums okay. devoted to this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I saw in in the last interview that you did with Krista Eva. I think this was it, it would have been a while back. Oh no, 2022. So not not too long ago. Krista quoted some stats between female and, and male victims, and it was, it was more balanced than, than I expected. Is there any updated stats on, I guess, male, female, undisclosed? And then also, you mentioned, one of you mentioned right at the beginning, children are also receiving it between, and I, and I assume that's the difference between children having adult abusers and also other children abusers stalking them. So is there any kind of like, picture on what it's like out there at the moment? I mean, for us, because we're a charity that dedicates working with children and women, right? we really only see female survivors come to us. Um, mm -hmm. Children is obviously very mixed. There is no gender bias there. Both male and female children are abused by perpetrator, abusive parent, hand in, gifts of technology, tracking devices, monitoring equipment. And so I can only kind of give you the perspective that we're seeing in the UK, which is very much there seems to be a gendered angle. And what we're also identifying is females seem to be disadvantaged because they haven't set the tech up. They mm. you know, feel very unconfident around navigating their tech safely. And most contracts and most information, most tech seems to be in the, the male's kind of name and responsibility. So he has most access. That's just the perspective that I can give. Emma. With the kids that you're seeing, is there? Do you see a split between adults and their peers stalking them? Um, predominantly, what we're seeing is around child contact and conflict. Um, okay. So when there's court orders in place, they're giving them GPS trackers to then try and monitor and find where they've moved to. But we're also we've got youth tech leads as well, so we're supporting um, young people because there's a normalisation around monitoring and tracking, and also what we're seeing in terms yeah. of kind of stalk aware is. <laughs> a lot of parental apps that are on the market under the guise of, you know, monitor your child, keep them safe. If you look at the features, it all has kind of hidden stalkerware features within. So I think that's something that we're unpicking as well as a real issue here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And Eva? Um, so uh, I get a wider variety of people who come to me. Um, but again, this is a self-selecting sample of uh, mostly English speaking people, mostly located in the United States. And of the people who come to me, I would say about two thirds are, uh, are women and about one third uh, are men. 
Uh, I see all kinds of stalking. I see, you know, men stalking women. I see women stalking men. I see, you know, men stalking men, women stalking women, non-binary people stalking, you know, e each other. Um, it's uh, the the whole the whole gamut happens, um, but the the majority of the abuse is. Uh, male perpetrators and uh, and female victims. So I would say like more than 50% of what I see is, uh, is that. Um, mm -hmm. I try really hard not to frame this as a sort of women's issue because I think it makes it a lot easier to dismiss. Uh, and also it, uh, it silences uh, the you know, male and non-binary uh, survivors of abuse and really creates this stigma uh, that keeps them from coming forward. Um, In, you know, w one of the things that we, you've mentioned several times is is the concept of uh, tracking devices. Now, I mean, I, I've been kicking around the industry long enough that you used to be able to buy things and stick a SIM card in them and throw them into the, you know, into the boot of a car with a magnetic thing and a couple of batteries and it would it would track for two weeks before it went flat. And now we have Apple tags, which are year-long batteries, um, tiny little things that are not using the, um, the the 3G network or a mobile phone network for their location. Uh, they're, they're, you know, they're pinging off, off other stuff. The, I guess there's two questions. One is, is, I'm assuming that these are being used more frequently now uh, and tracking devices are being used more frequently now than ever before. And secondly... Um, and this is a slightly contentious question, I suppose. Are the tech companies doing enough to prevent misuse? And, and this applies to the tags and to the technology implemented elsewhere in the uh, in the mobile phone ecosystem, largely, I imagine. But also, you know, other other areas. No, no, they're not. They're not doing enough. Um, they've got a long, long way to go. Um, I was just looking at the iOS updates for this year just to see if there's any features on there that we need to be concerned about. And again, there are a number of features that we are concerned about, like every year. Um, I think people kind of, they design tech. And I understand, you know, you want to make life more accessible, easier. People want this. There's a driver there. But sometimes there's certain features that are designed where you think they've almost gone into a prison and they've said to perpetrators, design this. And then they've put it on the market because it's that horrific. Um, ring fencing features, for instance, are a real bugbear of ours. But, and everyone talks about Apple AirTags, and I understand that, but that takes away the emphasis on the other forms of tracking and monitoring that we're seeing as mm. well. And I think then that we need to be mindful that we're only focusing on one element where there's multiple elements of tracking and monitoring. Smart cars are a huge concern for us, and they will be in the coming years. They're all GPS enabled, they have apps. You don't necessarily know who's connected to that app. You can ring fence location, it gives you kind of real time movements. You can make changes with mine, for instance. My husband, if he wanted to, could make changes and make me stop the car through my app while I'm driving the car. So it's just being mindful of there's different ways now in which somebody can track and monitor. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I do appreciate that the, the AirTags is the <laughs> easy commercial thing to wave around and, 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 and say. And yes, indeed, the, the track my iPhone thing has been kicking around a heck of a lot longer and, and, and lurking in the background of your iCloud account and has yeah. always been been available to, 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 to track your phone. Um, well, one of the, the one of the things that we've really done, um, uh, we've done a lot of work with uh, with Apple on uh, helping people to clarify uh, what information they're sharing and who uh, who they're sharing it with. So not a lot of people know about safety check, uh, but if you go down into your menus, uh, you can actually run a safety check on your phone, which is geared in, towards uh, sort of these kinds of close access domestic abuse, uh, data sharing and data leaking problems. So that's really helpful. And I, I wanna give Apple uh, credit where credit is due because I spend a lot of time yelling at them. Uh, in fact, I, uh, I will now yell at them about uh, iOS 17 um, because one of the, the features that they have introduced is a feature which allows you to, uh, to share the tracking of an AirTag. 
<laughs> so now we can have several people stalking you uh, with just a single air tag, and you will not discover who those other people are um, as a result of your security alert. Your air tag alert will only show you information about the person who is the you know primary owner of that tag. Uh, so I find that very disturbing. I haven't had a chance to test it out yet, and I try not to go crazy over a feature that I have not personally tested myself. Um, but uh, that's next week's project. Yes, yes, indeed. Mm. Um, and obviously, coupled with the conversation we just had about these these on these online uh, forums for this sort of thing, that that's a, a deeply scary concept. You, you mentioned that there is a particular thing. Uh, a menu item that, that has that. If you have a guide to how to get to that or can point us at that, we'll put that in the show notes so that anybody who is listening and is curious uh, and wants to double check is is able to do that. And I'd be very grateful for that. Thank you. And I rudely interrupted you in the middle of saying something else, so I apologize. Uh, no worries. Uh, um, so, yeah, the, uh, the other thing that I was going to say was... Uh, so the other thing that I was going to say is that Apple gets a lot of flack, uh, but uh, the entire industry of people making uh, Bluetooth-enabled physical trackers is crap. Uh, yeah. Apple actually has more anti-stalking capabilities built into the AirTag than, say, Tile, uh, which released a detection app and then months later released a way to disable the detection app by uh, by entering your tile into an anti-theft mode. Uh, so I uh, I reserve a great deal of my ire for uh, Life 360, which is the owner of Tile. So how would like this? This is an interesting point, I guess. Like it, I think people who make technology and software. There's an ever-growing list of compliance and, and considerations to make. And I think in, in terms of developers, this is niche, but a very important issue. How can they go about to better engage? And and I, I guess thinking from Australia, like I, I don't, like you're both based UK, US respectively, but in each of those three countries, where would developers go to kind of liaise with someone who knows about this and then can incorporate that into their tech early on for considerations. And then obviously th there's going to have to be trade-offs, right? Like people will abuse technology no matter what. It's just not, it's making it as hard as possible for that to happen. Yeah. I mean, I've included a link to some design principles. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Ah, amazing. Okay. Well, that's fantastic. <laughs> we'll share that with the, uh, with, with the, with the group as well. Um, so I think I think possibly more to to Emma, but how how is UK legislation managing to keep up at the moment? I mean, I've noticed my 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 daughter used to work for <laughs> rights for women uh, in the UK, so providing legal aid to, uh, to to survivors of domestic abuse and you know helping out in that regard. And she she pointed out that you know um, uh, economic abuse has only recently been included as. Uh, as a as a sort of form of domestic abuse since 2021, um, but yeah. how how well is UK legislation keeping up? Because we've also had recently the, um, and I can't remember which what, what exactly the law is, but the, the one that's gone through that says, uh, you know, we know that uh, service providers are now supposed to provide decryption and, and various assorted rubbish like that, which isn't going to work. But we'll worry about mm -hmm. that later. How well is the UK legislation actually managing to keep up? And is it getting better or is it just stagnantly sitting where it isn't good? I mean, it's not just the legislation. You, you've got the criminal justice system, police response, training. There's the whole structural system that kind of needs to work with the legislation. The Computer Misuse Act's 1990. So it, when offences fall within that, the police will say that it's, you know, it only really applies to terrorism and big corporate organisations, not intimate partner violence. In terms of economic abuse, there is no support effectively because if someone's took um, a number of loans out in somebody's name without their consent, that is fraud. Um, and if they report that to the police, they'll just get told to report to action fraud. You have a crime reference number and it's now your responsibility to negotiate with those creditors to try and get debt write-offs, which is an incredibly complicated process and very time consuming. So obviously we've just had the online safety bill just pass, but that's very much in the early stages and we're feeding in with Ofcom, the regulator, 
I imagine there'll be a number of different versions of that because tech changes rapidly. Um, but I don't. I just think that the way in which tech's evolving and the way in which the legislation sit in, it's not evolving at the same pace. And also the police response and their resources are very, very limited. They don't have the right resources to be able to respond to this kind of crime at all. Mm. Are you working with the police uh, as, a, as a group? I mean, obviously, uh, Refuge is... I mean, I've, I've, I'm well aware of the work that you do in the UK. You're a, a large charity, which, again, is not a good thing, but you're a large charity um, uh, doing doing great work. But are, are you are you able to engage with the police? Do they engage with you in providing, you know... Uh, you provide training to them to help them to get it better, and they, they negotiate and liaise with you to help uh, in, in specific yeah. cases? Yeah, so we've just designed a training package for the police and we started to roll that out, sp specifically the Met Police. But other forces, they're taking their time to kind of come on board with it. What we really need is the College of Police to roll this out and to take it seriously and to be able to support the police. So it's a mandatory training component. I, uh, I actually worked with a state senator in Maryland, in the United States, uh, to uh, write and pass a law requiring mm -hmm. all uh, uh, law enforcement officers uh, to get a mandatory training uh, in uh, how tech-enabled abuse works and how to investigate it. Uh, this law passed last year, uh, and so we've been seeing sort of the trainings happen this year, and uh, next year we will look into uh, how effective they have been. If it turns out that they have been effective, then I'm going to try to use this as a sort of model law in other states. And in just in context for those of us that have very little knowledge about America, how, how big is Maryland in comparison to other states? Is it a good, uh, a, a good model for a trial uh, in, in, in that regard? Maryland is a good model because Maryland is small. Uh, and so if you're going to run an experiment, you want to run it in a relatively small state. Uh, at a at a small scale before you you know before you start rolling out out in say like Texas or California, New York, uh, and so um, I I think it's a it's a good place to start, uh, and we will see how it goes. Uh, I I'm very skeptical of the power of legislation to fix these kinds of problems. People frequently ask me, you know, what kind of laws do we need to pass in order to stop tech-enabled abuse? And what I tell them is that there are already laws on the books and they simply don't mm -hmm. get enforced um, because of, of the problems that we have uh, with the justice system and the problems that we have with uh, our, our system of, uh, of law enforcement. And this is not going to get fixed with more legislation. And I assume that's the same for us in the UK, Emma, is, is that essentially we have laws that prevent various assorted things like fraud, for example, or I, I mean, the Computer Misuse Act is a bit sucky, but, you know, it's been manipulated into doing a great many things in the past. Um, but it's, it's, it's about the enforcement of it, not about the, the actual law itself. Exactly, exactly. I mean, when you've got survivors calling the police and then stating to them, this has happened to me and this falls under this legislation. So can you please go and like, you know, arrest my perpetrator under this legislation? Because they have no confidence that when they speak to the police that they're going to be able to understand the legislation. And interestingly, in the UK, only 4% of frontline police officers have had any training related to the so-called revenge porn legislation. So you've got 96% of frontline police officers have no clue of what that legislation actually entails. So they're not given the time or the resources to actually go and attend any of the training and have any of the information or the tools to be able to do their job properly. Mm. Yeah, I get it. It's, it's a balance, right? Like, I guess they're struggling with <clears throat> everything that has changed. Technology has exploded and then all these this legislation's come out, but they still need to do day to day. Do you, either of you see a way for that to happen? Because I guess it's police are now having, at least in Australia, I know, like they're, they're having to start training on how to handle different types of mental conditions as they might respond to sight. So that that's another thing that they have to respond to and, and get detailed training on. Is there kind of like a way that you can see that it works with police or maybe other support organisations that could alleviate that a little bit is do you kind of see a solution that is possible or is it 
just keep chipping away at at the the very large problem that that we have across a broad range of issues it's a very big question that it's kind of like solve question. solve the issue i'm trying to think um, of a way to answer it that isn't completely negative i'm really struggling uh, i think i think it's okay to be ne- like it, it could just be hey we just need to keep chipping away at it like it is a big issue amongst many other issues that we are facing particularly dealing with individuals like there's also just there's not one solution if there was a button that we could press mm-hmm. if there was a lever that we could mm-hmm. pull that would solve this problem we would have done it already uh it's a matter of uh of pushing in a lot of different places at once um, and certainly one of the elements where we feel that we can make a big difference is in the uh, the training of, uh, of law enforcement officers. Having said that, um, I think that there are limits to the, affection, uh, to the effectiveness of that training. And one of those limits is that uh, the uh, extent to which law enforcement officers are frequently perpetrators of abuse. Mm. Yes. And so when they see abuse cases, they are more likely to empathize with the abuser than they are with the survivor. And I think that that Mm -hmm. is a very serious problem that I am not able to solve from here. Yeah. Agreed. We have this similar problem as well. You can see the most recent report around the Met Police in particular, around how many frontline police officers are still serving when they've got very serious reports against them around sexual and domestic abuse. So there is that challenge as well. And misrepresentation, I'm obviously in Australia at the moment doing the research and that seems to be a theme here in Australia and in the UK around misidentification of who the victim is and who the perpetrator is. Right. And huge, huge concerns there as well. Mm-hmm. Is there many support organisations similar to uh, AFF and Refuge in Australia? Yes, so you have WESNET, so they're based in Australia, they're based in Bendigo, and they support okay. um, survivors with tech-facilitated abuse as well. Okay. Um, and and this is this is an interesting, potentially controversial question, and I apologise in advance if it is. Well, it is, I know it is. Um, one of the issues that I've certainly seen come, f- come to the fore in the UK is that... Um, the police are seeking to take digital forensic images of both uh, the offender and the victim's devices. Um, And quite often the victims are feeling uh, very much worse worse for wear uh, at the end of everything and don't wish their their, their privacy to be invaded any further. But in the case of tech-enabled abuse, is this it must be pretty critical to part of a prosecution in order to have a, a, a full image of a, of a, of a victim's device. Would you agree, disagree, have a viewpoint on it? I personally, and even may have a different one, but I personally disagree because I don't think that the information that you're going to find that proves that perpetrators monitored, tracked and surveyed that person sits on the victim's device. It sits on the perpetrator's device that's where you will find the evidence. It needs to be obtained from his device, not the victim's, because quite often they're going to hand that over. He's going to have removed everything. He's going to have, you know, wiped everything. So the evidence isn't there. It sits somewhere for six months. And then by the time they go to analyze it, any evidence that, you know, he was perpetrating against has removed. So it looks like it didn't exist. They need to take his devices. And also they're very perpetrators, very crafty. They will hand over their work devices and then work will become involved and say, we need those devices back. Um, It really depends on the case. Uh, But for the most part, yes, the evidence is on the perpetrator's device uh, and not necessarily on the survivor's device. There may be additional effort. There may be additional evidence on the survivor's device. Um, but if, as part of the investigation, law enforcement feels that that is uh, necessary in order to build the case, uh, they can go and make that argument to a judge and get a warrant. Oh, that's fair. So, I think I think there's a couple of things that I, 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 I have left to ask. One of which is, as a forensic examiner in cases that are being put to me what would you recommend that I look for as my 
first and, and perhaps subsequent ports of call in order to find good, solid evidence of tech-based abuse, tech-based control? What what sort of things should I be looking out for? I mean, it, it depends on depends. what kind of device you're looking at. <laughs> And what kind of tech-based abuse you're looking at? But certainly, you're going to look at you know the uh, you're going to look for misconfigurations. You're going to look for exfiltration uh, of data. Uh, any application that is uh, designed to uh, to hide from the user to you know just like not show up in the dock or not show up on a on a list of uh, of applications. Uh, anything that is uh, exfiltrating data about uh, location or messages, contents of messages, uh, contacts, uh, passwords uh, that, uh, that shouldn't be doing so. Those are generally the, the kinds of things that, uh, that I look for. And in that sense, it's not that different. Uh, from uh, from tracking an APT because these are people who are looking for pretty much the the same kind of stuff uh, that that an APT finds useful once they have uh, have gotten onto a, a device or into a network. And on a slightly broader sense, you know, what <laughs> what can we do as 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 decent human beings to try and improve the situation with regards to domestic abuse? I'm going to say you've opened my eyes to a couple of things that I wasn't aware of, and you know, as I said my daughter works uh, worked for a domestic abuse charity in the UK, so I, I'm not entirely oblivious to some of the concepts, and I'm still having my eyes opened, which is um, deeply worrying. Um, but what what more can we do as a society, as a, a as individuals? I mean, obviously, we don't want this to continue. What what is it? Can we write to Apple and ask them to stop? Um, being quite so frivolous with their technology? Can we appeal to our politicians and donate money to to, um, to refuge? What, what, what is the best way that we can start to, as a society or as individuals, help to address the, these issues? I mean, for us in the UK, we it's not really taken particularly seriously. We're the only kind of UK charity directly supporting survivors where there's tech concerns. We're a small team of 11 working nationally across the UK. And we have calls outside of the UK because people are really desperate for support. Um, and we have no government funding. So a lot of my time relies on trying to find partnerships, funding opportunities as well, when really we should be focusing our time and resource on dedicating to survivors. So our time is sometimes taken away from that priority. Um, and then there's putting the pressure on tech developers as well to make sure that they're designing products with safety in mind, contacting and speaking to agencies such as the Stalkware Coalition, Refuge, WESNet, Safety Net, making sure that they're asking for trends, themes, looking at reports, annual reports that we provide as well to look to see what's happening where tech-enabled abuse is concerned. And I'll I work for a digital civil liberties nonprofit, so I would be remiss if I did not point out that uh, you can give money to the Electronic Frontier Foundation at www.eff.org. Uh, we are a uh, international organization. We work all over the world. We work on problems all over the world because the internet is global. Um, having said that, I think that the most useful thing that men can do is uh, to, well, for one thing, to believe survivors when survivors come to them, uh, to take their concerns seriously, uh, and also uh, not to let your peers get away with this kind of abusive behavior, to make it clear that this kind of behavior is, uh, is not all right when you see it. Um, because honestly, it's not uncommon for uh, you know, people to, to track their partners and uh, to tell their friends about it, to tell strangers about it, to tell their workmates about it. They tell me about it. And this is a thing that I you know, specialize in opposing. Um, and uh, the most frequent kind of conversation that I have is usually with someone who tells me that, uh, that they needed to install stalkerware on uh, their partner's device uh, because they were abusing them 
because mm -hmm. they were abusing them and they needed to get evidence that they uh, that they were cheating or that they weren't where where they said they were or that they were you know sending messages to somebody that they said they weren't talking to uh, and that in and of itself is abuse uh, and it's really important for us uh, to sort of step in among our peers when we see this kind of thing uh, and, and to speak up and say that that's not okay. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I was going to say, normally we would close out with something a little more light-hearted, but I feel slightly off doing it today. I think I'll, I'll go with a slightly more more serious but still ending question of what are you going to be doing next uh, in terms of research or in terms of, I mean, technology or, or, or social? Uh, what, what's on the cards next for each of you? Eva? Uh, well, uh, the next things on my plate uh, mostly have to do with research around um, uh, Bluetooth enabled uh, location trackers. I've got some research which will be coming out in the next month or two. Uh, I have some additional research that I need to work on this week. Uh, uh, mostly, uh, you know, how these things work and what, um, you know, how the uh, detection environment is doing and what constitutes a, an effective mitigation uh, mm -hmm. for Bluetooth enabled uh, tracking because uh, it's a it's a problem that's really growing exponentially uh, and uh, so far the mitigations that we have pushed for don't seem to have been very effective. Um, and for me um, the Churchill Fellowship so looking at digital forensics looking at you know, different countries continents different responses best practice challenges barriers for survivors reporting and um, digital offenses and then um, theses, so kind of coding and analysis at the moment and looking at trends within domestic homicides and serious case reviews. And then we're doing a lot of work in the team as well around neurodiverse clients, survivors and tech facilitated abuse and black women's experiences of tech abuse as well. You, sorry, you, you interestingly opened a little door there that I, I have very curious about. That You said neurodiverse as a particular area of study yeah. is there uh, is that purely because there's not a well-defined sort of area of research around it or is it a particularly uh significant statistical issue that more neurodiverse people are victims that that it is caused for that well we don't know that's the problem there is a lack <laughs> of research um and everyone in my team has a particular specialism and it's based on their lived experiences or areas of interest as well. So no one's given a specialism when they have no kind of association with it. Um, so neurodiverse, we have people looking at assistive technology who are disabled users themselves within the team. So we're looking at different forms of tech and how the intersectionality of technology plays a part. Okay, well, that sounds really interesting. I'll be very, and, and in the way that you're publishing these, these are going to be published as academic papers or go the Churchill so Fellowship on. no it will just be kind of put out there in the public domain when I complete that in the spring next year and then the theses yes will be an academic paper all right well fantastic I look forward to, to seeing both the research and the paper at the end of it thank um, you. so so thank you very much well I, I'd just like to say thank you very much for coming on and talking to us um, I appreciate um, well, Emma, thank you for getting up in the morning um Eva you've had it easy so you know that's, I'm, not, I'm grateful that you came but it's one o'clock in the afternoon I'm not going to get too grateful um so uh, just to say again thank you very much it's obviously something uh, that is an incredibly important um topic that we need to discuss and we need to address uh, as an issue uh, and to have uh, two such experts on is, is actually a real privilege for us and we do hope that we'll have you on again in future uh, to discuss the outcomes of your research and, and the outcomes of your uh, experiments in uh, in US states to see whether that does actually make a difference or not. I am fascinated to find out, I must admit. Um, so uh, just to let the listeners know that the Forensic Focus podcast is available on YouTube, Spotify, Desi will remind me of all of the other places. Uh, our website. Our website, yeah, that's one of them. Um, and the Apple Podcasts and anywhere you can find uh, a reasonably 
a competent casting platform, we will probably be there. Transcripts are available. We will make um, efforts to make sure that there are links in the show notes to everything that we've talked about, Refuge, EFF, um, any of the other charities that are dealing with domestic abuse, um, including Rights for Women and um, any others that we can come up with, so that if you do need to get in touch with someone who can help you out, please uh, do contact one of the charities that we will put in, in the links. But then that just leaves me to say, again, thank you very much for your time. It's very much appreciated. And we will close there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you.